Good morning, troops. This is your rabbi commander. Ah, yes, I think it was funny. But I got a couple of scriptures I'd like to read for you today, and maybe the outfit will make sense then. My first one is going to come from Isaiah 49, 16. And here's what it says. Actually, it'll start at 49, verse 14. And Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her baby or not feel compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you upon the palms of my hands, and your walls are ever before me, always. Your children will hasten to return, and your rulers and your destroyers will leave you. Raise your eyes all around and see that they have gathered, they have come to you. As I live, the word of Hashem, the Lord, I swear that I will clothe you and clothe yourself with them, all like jewelry, adorn yourself like a bridegroom. That's my first text. My second text is from Second Timothy in our New Covenant. And here's what Second Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1, says. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is the Lord Yeshua. And the things that you have heard me say, okay, you heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one engages in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You know, I think sometimes we forget that there's a thing called military discipline, and that doesn't mean a spanking. In fact, you know, military discipline means there's order, there's structure. And in fact, that's true even in faith. Oftentimes people, they set aside what they know out of fear of what they don't know. And a good soldier simply follows the orders. God gave us the Holy Scriptures in order for us to follow. Now, I know there are people who are nervous or fearful or even ill-prepared for this virus event that's upon us. Nevertheless, God says, do not worry. I have carved you on the palm of my hand and you are ever before me. You are ever before him. And yet there are people who say, well, I feel so alone. Well, you're not alone. Matter of fact, last time I checked, God had no orphans. You're not an orphan. Do you understand that? You're not an orphan. <laughs> you're God's holy chosen child. Now, let me tell you some history. The Jewish people have been around for ages. Literal, literal ages. From the time of Abraham. And how is it that Judaism and the Jewish people have survived? When they've gone through Holocaust, pogroms, inquisitions, okay, war after war, conquered by every other nation on the planet. How is it that Judaism and Jews have survived? Because they never depended, never depended on the synagogue. They enjoyed the synagogue, they gathered as they're supposed to. But Judaism has survived because it exists in the home and in the heart of the very people. You know, when the woman sits at the table on Friday night, which is tomorrow, and she okay, and she starts inviting the Lord into her house and then turns to her husband who does the blessings. This is Judaism at its finest point. When the family has come together under one roof, there's no priest, there's no rabbi, unless you're a Kohen, there's no priest. Okay. But yet, the blessings are said. The children receive a blessing. The wife receives her blessing. The husband receives a blessing by fulfilling his obligation to his family. Oftentimes, in such situations, the father will sit there and with his Tanakh in front of him, 
to begin to expound on the reading of the week. And it's glorious when you stop and you look at the idea that God supplies to his people all that they need. Yes, the synagogue for a while has closed its door, okay, which means we have no public meetings. But we're a smart people. So we go to virtual synagogue. And on Shabbat, there will be virtual synagogue. It will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll say the prayers and read the Torah and have the drash. It will be real. And the other thing you need to understand is that it's going to be real in your home. Because that's where God has blessed us. God has given us the ability to adapt and overcome. The Jewish people have always suffered some level of assimilation, but never gave up their identity. You shouldn't give up your identity. Because, once again, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Try this. Greater is he that's in me than the coronavirus that's in the world. You know? So what? There's a virus. Yes, we have to hunker down and do those type of things, but that's okay. It makes sense that we should be good soldiers for the Lord. Now, being a good soldier doesn't just seem mean to hunker down. <clears throat> what are you going to be doing for the kingdom during this period of time? What are you going to be doing for those around you, even though you're not supposed to have contact? Oh, and I like that new term. Was it social distancing? I don't really like it. You know, I'd rather shake my brother's hand and you know and embrace. But the reality is that we have a situation. But what can you do for the sake of the kingdom? Because everything, sirs, is the mission. Everything is our mission. Maybe to go in all the world and preach the good news, or to tend to the needs of those who are without. I heard the other day of one of our people who made sure that another one of our people had food. And they took them groceries. You know, you can take groceries and leave it on the doorstep. You can ring the bell and step back a few feet, social distancing. You can still fulfill the purpose of Judaism. Because, you know, you can believe anything you want. A lot of people do. But the difference here in all this is not what you say, it's what you do. Now, oftentimes in Christendom, the idea is that we mentally ascend to the fact that there's a God. And that's true. And we mentally ascend to the fact that the Bible is true. And it is. We mentally ascend to the idea that Yeshua is God's only begotten Son. And we do. But what do you do with that information determines how true your faith is. How true your Judaism is. See, in Israel, they don't really care what you believe. They only care what you do because they measure your faith, your devotion to God. Let me see if I can give you an example. I was sitting with one of the cabinet members of Netanyahu. And he looks at me and says, ah, you're Messianic. I said, yes, yes. He says, and are you kosher? I go, yes. Do you relate to filling? Yes. And then I began to say, and we read from the Holy Torah, we keep the high holy days and the Shabbos and the wife lights the candles and all this. And finally, this minister of Netanyahu says to me, you're more Jewish than I am. I said, yeah, maybe, maybe. It's not my job to judge someone else's heart or their faith or even better, the practice. You know, I think a lot of people have become disenchanted with some churches and some synagogues because it's not the preaching that falls short. It's the practice. Do you love your neighbor? Or at least somebody. <clears throat> I'm fearful of the fact that you know, the script says to love your neighbor as yourself. When there's so many people says, well, I don't like me, so I don't like you either. Well, you know, at some point, you have to accept the fact that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so you wouldn't be such a miserable wretch. And so, love yourself some, and then love others. 
And God so loved you. So loves you. Not past, but present and future tense. There's a reality that's involved here as a good soldier for the, for the Lord. And that's that we carry out our mission no matter what the environment is. Now, the state of Colorado last night passed an ordinance that all churches, synagogues, religious, religious institutions cannot gather more than 10 people at a time. Well, how convenient. At least I can get a minion if I can get a minion. But the reality is, once again, my dear friends, is just because we have this thing, this virus thing going on, it doesn't dismiss us from our obligation to be good servants or good soldiers for the Lord. And so, in all this, I suggest love your neighbors yourself. Get on the phone. If you got an extra bag of beans, find a place to share it. Don't simply close yourself in. And I forgot my potato, but don't be a couch potato. This is my potato, virtually, theoretically. <clears throat> and you can do wondrous things because I believe with all my heart that this is a time that we can actually capitalize on for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. But it won't be done in a service. It won't be done with the, pe with the preacher in the pulpit. It won't be done with the choir or the music or you know, the praise band. It'll be done one person at a time, caring for someone else, sharing their true faith, not what they believe, but what they do. You're able to do this. I know you are. And that this could be a good thing for the kingdom of God. So be aware of those around you, that you can drop a kind word, that you can, when possible, help. Don't be afraid to share what you have. God is our supplier, not Sam's or Walmart or one of these other clubs. God is our supplier. And we will not only conquer and overcome, we shall come out glorious. The kingdom shall come out glorious if we will just simply live out our faith and not become fearful. I guess that's the best word for this whole thing is fearful. See, myself, I'm in that age group in which uh, I'm a target. So I'm going to practice good, sound uh, stewardship over my life and over my body, but I'm not going to do it at the expense of the gospel, if need be. Now, let me go ahead and tell you a couple other things. We have to pray for people. We have people in our community and people we know who are ill with more than just the virus. We have problems with people with flu or uh, injuries. We have people who have uh, immune systems which are uh, been deficient. We can pray for them and pray for their strength. And I guarantee you, your prayers, your prayers, my friend, will be as valuable as amoxicillin. Your prayers are as valuable as anything else that can be done. Now, please, be kind one to another. And I know I'm dressing up. You know, I think it was Rabbi Schiffman who said, if you can't teach them, at least entertain them. Hopefully I'm being entertaining on some level and teaching yet while on another. And God's grace will go forward. Now, let us remember those who are ill among us. Let's remember Amy. Let's remember Leanne. Let's remember uh, Seth. And uh, I think my friend Joe Fawcett. Sorry, no last names. Okay. And, of course, Budgie and Anna 
and others. And let's remember that God should be glorified in our lives during this time. There is something you could do. I really don't understand this Facebook thing very much. I don't know what hitting a like button does, but at least it'll tell me that somebody's watching. Either way, watch, don't watch. I am going to do this because I'm being as faithful as I can with what God has given me. You be as faithful as you can with what God has given you. And in this, the kingdom of heaven will prosper first. I don't want to just get by. I want to overcome. I just don't want to have a miserable existence. I want to take this time and let it be glorious. God is good. You are too. So let's do our job and glorify God together. I'll see you tomorrow. And don't forget to hit the like button so I can figure out what that's all about. Okay? Thank you.